So anyway, um, this is pretty interesting. And I hate Bloomberg with a mad passion. This is the first thing Bloomberg's done in a long time. I actually get a trick. This is the global fertility crisis, which, of course, everything about the article is garbage like it always is. But this is an interesting chart. This is the global average. And here's the different nations. And so way down at the bottom is like Singapore, Italy, Hong Kong. And the U.S. is pretty much U.K. And the U.S. is down here some there, too. And this is something I've heard about a long time. So all these countries now have below population sustaining fertility rates. And this, I read uh, Hans Bethe wrote a book about this over the last couple of centuries. This is the point. When I was a kid, they had this book called Silent Spring in the 60s. And they said the population is going to grow until we all die and destroys the environment and everything. And none of that happened because... It turns out that when people are not desperately poor, and especially when women get some rights, they don't want to have like 12 kids anymore. And the first thing they do is use birth control and stuff and get down to like one or two kids. That's what most people want to do. And so after you give people enough technology, that they're not absolutely penniless, the birth rate falls a lot. And I think that's fine. The whole point there was that we have way too many people. We should have only about 10% of the people we have now. We've got too much carbon dioxide, too much fire, too much pollution. And so anyway, then the rest of us are freaking out saying, oh, the economic model requires constant growth and the stock market needs to keep going up. So we need to keep the population going up. I'm like, no, we've hit the limit of the planet. What we need to do is have the population go down to a small fraction of what it is now. If we had about 10% this many people, we could all live in luxury and drive cars and airplanes and everything and have parks and stuff. And I think that's where we should go. So I think it's fine. But of course, the short term governments and corporations that just want to see more profit in the coming quarter all think, oh, we need more people. But, um, you know, anyway, so but it's interesting to watch, interesting to see. Everybody is getting upset about their population declining. I remember most of my life, everyone's complaining about the population growing too much. And China had their one child policy and everything else. It's news to me that you would get upset about this instead of thinking this is great. But anyway, it's an interesting chart. And um, so this is good clean. I've been hearing about this for at least 20 years, the idea of having a fast charging battery for cars. And the previous plans were to make capacitors, because if you have capacitors, they charge very fast, but they don't hold enough charge. So the batteries hold more charge because they have a electrolyte in them that has electrons, ions moving around inside a liquid. And the problem with that is it's slow. So you can't charge them very fast. That's why they hold much power. But so apparently they figured out a way to do lithium ion batteries that can charge fast. And the prop, yeah. Oh, one thing is great faster too. That's the issue. The issue is if you charge them fast, they would heat more and it causes an uh, irreversible chemical reaction and breaks down the battery. And they've found that what all you have to do is heat them to a high temperature and let them cool down before you charge them. And now the heat they get during charging doesn't hurt them so much. So it's like annealing or something. Anyway, doesn't really make any sense their explanation, but um, apparently it's true. So. We'll see. But anyway, they say they're going to have batteries that can charge in 10 minutes and give you enough power to go 200 miles. So it'll be as fast as filling a gas tank. Anyway, that is Liz, ain't it? <laughs> An unusual person to be here. Glad to see you. We got a celebrity. Anyway, so, uh, anyway, so uh, this I thought was awesome. They had a suspicious package at the train station. So they called the experts, they came there to like detonate it, and it turned out what it was, was their new device to detect suspicious packages. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's really great, you know, anyway, so. <laughs> well, it's, you could say it works, that's one way to look at it. Anyway, um, all right, so, and I, I've been teaching Violet Python for years, from a book where you just do basic simple hacking things in Python, and I wanted to do it in Go, so now I got this going, this is what I'm planning to do at B-Side San Francisco. I have another week, by the way, you should all give talks or something at B-Side San Francisco. I know you guys are, there's another week, we have until the 6th to submit, and uh, they love hands-on stuff there. And when I gave ones before, they kind of thought they were too hard, they only wanted to do the easy stuff. Like I taught cryptography, and they all just wanted to do binary games. And I'm like, well, gee, I mean, that's all right. So I don't think they get too upset, and it turns out it's pretty easy. Just like Python, everyone said Go is great because it's almost as easy as Python and much faster, and it turns out, Installing Go is pretty easy, just a couple of commands. And once you've got Go, this is Hello World, which is not a whole lot more than you'd have to do in, in Python. And here's a port scanner in Go that will do 65,000 ports on the local address. It's a little messed up, but it's not too hard. It's actually pretty much like Python. You import a library, do a couple of calls, 
Um, I don't understand this colon equals garbage. But anyway, one thing about it is you have to tell it the name of every, um, you have to tell it what type of variable everything is, and that's all right. Anyway, turns out I can you write banner grabbers and stuff. So I'm going to just translate all my violent Python stuff into Go and teach violent Go. That's my plan. So this is already up for in one of the classes. It's part of extra credit project 127, although if you want to do it in any other classes, you can. Um, and I'll have a series of these and make a workshop out of it. So we're on the cover of SS Weekly. Someone grabbed me at the coffee house at like five this morning and said, you're on the cover. And I'm like, huh, what? So anyway, they called us and interviewed us. And uh, this is a very good article about our program saying good stuff. Now that we're approved by the NSA and the DHS, that's something to brag about. And the other thing, of course, is the competitions where we're up there with Stanford and big colleges. And so they're saying, how can you be up there when you're just a little two-year college with no money and they're just collapsing and losing your accreditation and firing everybody? And they said, well, it is pretty good, isn't it? So they're, yeah, that's pretty awesome. So they interviewed a bunch of us and wrote a good article about it. So hopefully all of this will help uh, shake more money out of the tree or something. And also one at Stanford. So cut their budgets or give the guys a big raise if they want to do it. Well, well, it's Stanford. Well, at, what did they do at Stanford? Well, they, they say you don't have a budget. They're, you know, they're firing everybody. At Stanford? Well, here they are. Here. Yeah, here they are. Not at Stanford. If we move to Stanford? Well, if you do those things at Stanford, that's a good idea. But you know, as a matter of fact, I happen to know the Stanford team is getting no support from Stanford at all. Really? It's not even a teacher running it. It's their network administrator. And he gave up his office so he can work in the hallway so they can practice in his office. So he is, in fact, thriving under similar conditions of pretty much being kicked around and abused. Yeah, it does seem to be what hackers thrive on is abuse. Anyway, so I read that article. What? Oh, today. It's, and it's in my news links, too. It came out today. Yeah. And uh, you can get it on hard copy all over San Francisco. And if you want it, uh, I got the links are here in my news. So it's, uh, it's one of these things from today. Yeah, this one here. City College Cybersecurity Program stands out. So it's out there. Anyway, they, they did a good job of interviewing a lot of people and finding good quotes from each of several people. I was very impressed. Usually, journalism is terrible. Every time I read an article about something I know about, I'm usually horrified at how they get it all wrong. But he pretty much got it right. There's no significant errors, and he, he, got the interest, he picked the interesting parts out of some interviews. He put a lot of work into it. So this is pretty good fun. I, Europe has a digital identity system for their government things, like a lot of people do. And apparently, what they did is the same thing Microsoft did in Internet Explorer 3, they have a certificate chain and they forgot to validate the higher levels of the chain. So you can just make a fake certificate and they won't actually verify the higher levels. So you can totally fool this thing into thinking that you're a member of another state and deserve various rights when you don't deserve them and all that jazz. This tends to happen. People do this a lot. Um, you're supposed to have a certificate that is signed by a higher authority that's signed by a higher authority that's eventually signed by somebody where you have a hard-coded key so you know it's the right person. But Internet Explorer didn't bother testing it, and a lot of Android apps don't bother testing it. So you can just give them a fake certificate claiming to be signed body by somebody who is not actually trusted, and they don't bother to check or care or anything. Um, all right. And Twitter is not going to have any more political ads, which is pretty interesting. Trump is mad, and Ocasio-Cortez thinks they're great. And Facebook has come out and said, we're going to carry ads and continue to publish them when we know they're completely lies anyway. Except when a San Francisco guy ran for mayor just to put up a fake ad. They then canceled his ad. So they don't actually live up to that. And this is, you know, so that's why I think everyone says, you know, if we start trying to figure out truth from lies in politics, it's really hard and we'll never get it right. So Twitter has a simple answer. This is uh, avoidance, right? Just don't do it at all. And now I don't have to decide what's right and wrong. Facebook is jumping right in where angels fear to tread in claiming they're going to somehow decide whether you're really a politician, to decide whether you're really lying, and let you lie if you're in the good category, not let you lie if you're in the bad category, and they don't seem to realize what a snake's nest they're wandering into here. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, so let's go on with the uh, instant response stuff. And what happens is I got the usual stuff, chapters in the book here about analysis, and I got some new projects. Last week I didn't have new projects, I said I was working on them, so I got it working more or less. And uh, this is enterprise class stuff. So what you have to do, if you haven't done this, if you haven't set up Windows domains, you need to learn how to do it. It is pretty tedious. But you have to make a, a domain controller and a member server, and then you can install this LAN desk, which is now Ivanti. And it really is pretty long and slow and horrible. But I mentioned these are the next projects for the next couple of weeks. Um, and, I'm sorry. Anyway, so... Um, 
Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. Is it, is it like listening to us? Great. Anyway, so so you make a cloud server and you have to make it a domain controller. You install Active Directory management. And what this does, this is the whole point of Windows servers. You have a central point of administration so you can control everything. The Microsoft domain controllers are designed to control what's happening on a machine. And this is the first level of defense for all corporations. You have to have a domain controller, which now means everybody who logs in, logs into the domain controller. So all passwords are on the domain controller only. And you, a, a, cust, a uh, employee with a domain login can go to any machine and log in with their account. And it'll know who they are and move their desktop to them and all that jazz. That's what it's for. And this means if you fire somebody and you want to take their credentials away, you take them away on the main controller, and now even if they're in a branch office, they can't log in anymore. You really have gotten rid of them. And if you want to push out like a patch or a software update from the domain controller, you know that every machine has it. They cannot log into the domain again without that patch going on. That's the point of this. And that is the first step of controlling a, uh, a company. And for many companies, that's enough. And this is why everyone buys Microsoft. But that is the, this is the Microsoft default level, is a setting up a domain controller. And so and you have these Active Directory users and computers, instead of having local accounts on the machine, they're stored in the domain controller and you create them here. There are groups of users and user accounts here and you specify whether they're administrator or whatever they are on the domain controller. That's the point of this thing and you have to get used to it. And then you, your machines can join the, sir, the domain. So you make a machine and then you have to change the DNS server to point to your domain controller. So it can find your domain, which I called hackme.com, and then you can join that domain. And in order to join it, you have to join a domain and now you have to give an administrator password to join. And now the security settings of that machine are controlled by the domain controller and group policy, not by local settings you make on this machine. So that's the Microsoft enterprise control of machines. However, it turns out that that is not enough control for modern businesses. And that was the point of what we talked about last time. So this is what Microsoft gives you. And this was a huge hit and people using it for decades but modern companies need even more, and that's what this stuff is for, <coughs> Landesk. If you need even more control over what everybody is doing than what Microsoft gives you, then you pay for another product on top of it, and this stuff is probably expensive. Landesk, Ivanti bought Landesk, and you get like a 45-day free trial, and when I installed it, their, their sales team will actually call you up to like try to get a commission and make sure it's working for you and stuff. So obviously, it costs a lot of money. So I, anyway, I got it. We have to install this stuff. And now you have even more control over everything everybody does. So turn off a bunch of junk, get Avanti on here. Here's my trial version of Avanti. And I had, it took me a long time to get this working. It is not easy to install, not easy to use. Like all enterprise stuff, it's big and complicated. And you get all these things going on there. And once you have activated your server and everything else, you now have a management console <laughs> And in the management console, you can find out all kinds of stuff of what's happening in your domain. There's a wizard with many settings where you have to you run a scanner to find the machines, and then you push an agent down to the machine and put it under remote control with an agent running on it. And now you can monitor and control everything it does. And the same thing applies to like cell phones and tablets and everything. You can control everything in this interface, and everybody pretty much has to do this. It turned out to be quite a drag to do, and there were a lot of special cases. But when you're all done, your machine will appear in a list of known machines here. And then you can see what's happening on that machine. And that was the point of the last one. You really spent a lot of time just going through the wizard. And uh, when you're done, you will be able to actually see what's happening on that machine. You set up a configuration like here's default Windows configuration with status. This is how you create the agent. Now, it's supposed to be able to push the agent down and install it, but that did not work. And they have a blog of like alternative procedures. So I actually had to turn on file sharing and move it down with file sharing and build it separately. But then now you can actually gather inventory. And now you see I have the domain controller and my member server. By the way, you can't install this stuff on the domain controller. That's what I tried to do. In fact, that's how one of the, like the third time I did it wrong and had to tear it all down. I installed this thing. And then I reached the point where I said, you have to put it in a domain log. And I said, Domain, oh crap. So I took that machine and promoted it to domain controller that already had the Avanti on it. And that created a monstrosity that didn't work at all, of course. And so then I threw it all away and made a new one. Anyway, so that's why they were calling me. Why are you installing this like six times for your free trial? And I'm like, well, you know, because I'm an idiot and I did it wrong five times. <laughs> anyway, so I finally got it working and that's where you'll be. So now you can see all the software on that machine. And 
you'll have a log of every software they launched and all that jazz, and that's the point of it. So anyway, that's, uh, that's basically you get to play with that stuff that we talked about last time, and it's not terribly exciting. It's not really hacking, but it is the necessary administration stuff. And if you're not used to Windows domains, you really need to get used to them. If you go into like CCTC or CPTC, everybody's using these things. And at first they seem baffling and complex. So you auto start getting over it. Everybody's using them. And uh, domains and group policy are just a big bushel basket of facts and terms you have to learn. Good idea to take like Windows Server class. We have several around here. I used to teach that stuff. And, uh, it's really important, but it is pretty baffling at first. Anyway, so let's talk about the analysis methodology. This is pretty simple stuff. Um, I probably won't take too long for this lecture, and I'll stick around to help people if you want to work on projects. Anyway, so the point is um, when you're going to do it, try to uh, do a um, investigation of some sort, trying to analyze some kind of incident, then you have to decide what you're trying to achieve and focus on it. This is the fundamental issue of malware analysis and also forensic investigation. In both malware analysis and in the more broad area of like forensic investigation, the problem is you have too much data. You have like a 500 gig hard drive and maybe 100 machines and firewalls and incident and uh, IDS systems and all this junk. And you could spend months digging through all that junk if you don't have a goal. You have to decide what your goal is and focus on your goal and ignore all the irrelevant facts to get there. That's the trick. So um, first, you've got to have objectives. So you do have to have a commanding knowledge of what's going on. And this is why they want you to have like certifications like the CISSP, which doesn't mean you know all the details, but it means you know the big picture. So you understand like what could be done and what general products would be required. And therefore, you can make a reasonable plan of the goals. So what are you trying to find out and what kind of facts will it take to get there? And one thing that is very much a problem is that a lot of people like high privileged stakeholders, like CEOs, will make unreasonable demands that cannot be accomplished. Like the simplest one, right? If you say, I have a web server, uh, how much uptime do we need? You say, well, we need 100%. What are you talking about? It has to stay up. Now we've got a problem. There's no such thing as 100%. Google is not 100%. Nobody on earth can pay for 100%. But they don't know that, right? They say, look, it's supposed to stay up. What's wrong with you? Are you stupid? They're like, well, one of us is stupid, but you know, this is where social skills matter. The fact is, they don't really mean 100%. If you say, well, it was down for five minutes at midnight one day a year, that wouldn't kill us. Well, no. Well, then you didn't really mean 100%. You have to understand the difference between technical people and non-technical people. Anyway, so they'll often ask you unreasonable things, like make sure there's no malware on our network. You know, well, there is nothing on earth that can do that, like Australia. They say, we're going to block all the malware and all the pornography and all the stolen content on the internet. Just put up a firewall and get rid of that stuff. And they're like, uh, dude, we can't do that. And they say, shut up and do it. That's, that's, and they keep on trying to do it, despite the fact that it can't be done. So here's the thing. Figure out what you need, who you're trying to send results to, and what they plan to do with them. This is a fundamental issue in all technology. And it was true when I taught fiber optics, too. The problem is you have to educate the customer. You have to sort of negotiate with them. The same thing through lawyers, you know. Go and talk to a lawyer, and they, they say what they want, and the lawyer has said, well, you know, let's talk about what you can get. So you have to sort of negotiate with the stakeholders to help them understand what is achievable and what is not achievable. So that's the point. You've got to have leaders, and you have to make sure everybody knows who's in charge, and then um, move forward. And often you have a clueless high-level leader that doesn't really know what's going on, and you have an intermediate person who's the technical person, and their job is to translate the sort of Ten Commandment-like vague general statements they're getting from above into actionable intelligence and please both parties. So, uh, for example, you cannot prove that a server is not compromised. That's impossible. What you can do is find out if it has certain particular malware or something, if it had making unfamiliar network connections, but how could you ever know it's perfect? You could rebuild it from a known good image from zero or something, or restore it from a backup at a time when you believed it was clean, but that could be wrong. And that's what Google found out. They found out when um, China hacked them that uh, they had put malware on them that would hide for three years. So even their backups that were known clean were in fact not clean. And that's the thing, what's clean? By the way, I noticed your t-shirt. That's, that's a good one, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's good, there should be more of those out there. I think people seem to have forgotten this. Anyway, so, all right, so anyway. Um, so that's the game. Your audit trails don't cover everything. There's nothing back to the back of time. There's no such thing as a perfectly clean machine. And by the way, your software you purchase has malware in it too, and the hardware you purchase has malware in it too on occasion. So 
you know, perfect cleanliness is not possible to get and possible to prove. You have to settle for a more reasonable thing. So you can look for certain indicators of compromise and say they're not there, and therefore certain known things are not happening. That's about all you can do. So, and then you can make an opinion that, you know, I've tested it with all reasonable tests, and this is as clean as, as anything gets, so this is good enough to use, which is not the same thing as saying it's 100% clean. All right, so here's, you know, you can't really determine that, but you could determine if there's a particular thing on there. These are realistic questions. So again, you have to watch the scope. Uh, you can't just say, read all the email, look at all the hard drives, find all the badness. This is not useful. This is sort of like the uh, NSA right now and the DHS where they've hoovered up all the traffic on the internet and all the phone calls. Stick it in Utah. There, find all the bad guys. You've got everything you need. It's, well, in one sense, we do have everything you need. In another sense, we don't have what we would need to do that. So anyway, that's the game. So it's better is to have a more specific goal of what you're doing. So you have to ask why. And that's the point. People will make a foolish request and you say, well, you don't really need that. Let's talk about what you really need. What you really need is to have sufficient functionality and sufficient security so we can meet our regulatory requirements and our customers can get work done. And, you know, you don't need perfection anywhere. You just need to hit good enough to where we're up to industry standards, up to our competitors, up to what the regulators want. That's stuff you can achieve. Anyway, that's the game. Um, so you have to know where your data is. I mentioned before many times, this is probably the first really hard question is where is your data? Most people have got no clue. In fact, it's scrolled all over the place. Employees, Gmail, Dropbox, thumb drives, cloud services, just everywhere and totally out of control. And you got to rein that in. So you got to find all the places it is, your virtual storage, your cloud services, everywhere it is. And then you can start talking about how you secured it. Your servers, you have your own servers and your own data center, and that's more or less under your control. But then, of course, these days you've got cloud services, and even your servers are often using all sorts of complicated storage systems like storage area arrays and such. And then you've got all those mobile devices. Everybody's bringing in laptops and phones and tablets and USB sticks and iPads and all iPods and all these goofy things. And they're all carrying company data on all those things, and you probably can't stop them from doing it even if you want to try. So you might like a solution like Microsoft OneDrive, which I think has a new name now, which makes sure that everything is always encrypted with a key that's derived from your Active Directory login. So when you fire somebody and they cannot log into Active Directory anymore, all their copies on all of your devices are now encrypted. They don't have a key. So now it is not so big, such a big problem that they have extra copies all over the place. You still have some control. Of course, nothing's perfect. They could have like photographed the screen and have that on their phone, and that wouldn't be encrypted, but it's a lot better than not having any control at all. And like I say, all these removable storage things, which got people, people were awakened to this largely by um, Bradley Manning, who snuck in a burnable CD marked Lady Gaga songs and burned all the secret data on it, classified data, and then snuck it out. And so it was a burnable CD that he used to exfiltrate it. And that woke everyone right up to the fact that you can carry on these thumb drives, put a lot of data on them, get them everywhere, and you can't really, like, stop people from doing that. So, you know, even if you have a locked room and the machines are chained to the wall, it's not really true that your data is contained and limited. Anyway, then, of course, you've got your network devices. Now, network devices, you might not think are too important because they don't store any user data. You don't have any spreadsheets or files or anything on your firewall switches and routers, but they're valuable targets of attack because you can use them as an entry point into the network. And this is quite common. You put malware on the router. Now you add malware to all the files downloaded through the router and scan the network from there and attack known ports. So it's often a way to get in. Routers and critters are good ways into a network. You can, they are connected to the network and they have some ability to run software and, and Attack that ever. Then, of course, you got the cloud services, which is the big one. The number one reason people are afraid to go to the cloud is because they're all afraid of the security risk. And this is obviously true. Everybody and their brother is getting hacked by putting their stuff in the cloud, primarily Amazon buckets, or but other many other services. You put your stuff in the cloud, now it's in somebody else's hands. And what if they're an idiot and lose it? And this happens all the damn time. So it's a problem. Um, you got backups too. Now your backups, you could store them locally, but that's a terrible idea because if the building burned down, they'd be gone. So you have to get them off site. Now, how do you get them off site? 
you could Iron Mountain will actually come to your building with like an armored car and take drives and drive them off and lock them in a vault somewhere, but that's expensive. So for a while, a lot of companies would like give it to some low paid employee, like a secretary and say, here, take this to at home or something. And then they started getting stolen out of the backseat of people's cars where they were going to bars and stuff. And that's not good either. So now a lot of people use cloud services as backup which is not a bad idea either. But anyway, you're going to have to have some plan here. You have to make sure that your backups actually work. It's quite common. This happened to companies I worked at. The backups were not working. Nobody noticed for months. Then when you need them, they're not there. Some guy has not been rotating the tapes. He's just been using the same tape for a month or something stupid. You have to actually have a, a plan of regularly testing your backups. Like every month, restore a file and make sure it works. Because it could be not working for a year and you wouldn't know if you don't test it. Yeah. Is tape still a bar consider viable? Uh, at least as of um, maybe 10 years ago when I was in the business, a lot of people used tape. Tape is the cheapest storage for, for a large quantity. Yeah. Very reliable. Yeah, very reliable. And the only thing wrong with tape is it might take a while to restore if what you need is at the other end of the tape. But for a thing like backup where you really don't need it in a hurry, it's the cheapest way to get a copy. I think a lot of people move into cloud backups, but if you want to store a lot of stuff, tape is the cheapest way to store it. And it's fine as long as you don't let it get hot. So this is pretty good cleanse for cloud backups. Rudos Giuliani um, was lost all the data on his iPhone. He forgot his passcode. So we went to the Genius Bar and they were stored for my cloud backup, just an ordinary Genius Bar. But everyone's freaking out. But you've got like national security secrets. You shouldn't be doing that. What's wrong with you? But anyway, that's really stupid. I say they interviewed uh, last week. They asked the Trump team and said, who thinks that Rudolph Giuliani is actually helping you? They said, there is one person around here that thinks that Rudolph Giuliani is helping us. All the rest of us would love to get rid of him. But that one guy is important. So, Rudy, yeah. Yes. And he's been the mayor of New York and he was very popular. At one time, he was everybody's hero, but he just seems to be a bumbling clown these days, just making a fool of himself. What's that? Well, that's, that's what people say, that Trump is faking it all, too. If they are faking it, they're doing a good job of faking it. Um, yes, that is one option. I've had some people tell me that, that this is all a master plan, and Trump is a super genius just pretending to be bozo to throw you off your guard. And if so, it's working. Well, I think Giuliani is the biggest one of these fakes. Well? It looks like, he looks like he doesn't know what he's doing, but that's like kind of the genius of him. Well, that's, that's an interesting analysis. And, and Every bozo subscribes to that. <laughs> yeah, that could be. Yeah, go ahead. And he's super genius. Yeah. And yet, he's doing things. I'm doing the right now. He would just yeah. like that. He would. He looks very well. If it if it's an act, it's working very well. Almost everybody has written him off as as a loser. Anyway, so um, so you got here's common types of evidence. You got the operating system itself, which is usually not very interesting. It's usually just configuration files. Then you got applications, user data, and network data. These are types of data out there. The operating system is, of course, stored on the system drive, Windows or Mac, typically, or Linux. <coughs> and the operating system itself has probably got nothing personal. The only thing interesting there would be logs to see if it's been infected and to keep track of what, what uh, applications have been launched and the configuration settings of things, which are in things like the registry, the syslog, and plist files. Um, there are file systems all over the place. We talked a bit about this. This is the old-fashioned hard disk forensics. You've got... Um, an allocation unit on the hard drive on Windows boxes, it's typically a four kilobyte is the smallest allocation unit that can be put in a file. You have active files, which are the ones that are currently in use. So they have a file name and a creation date and an owner. And deleted files, the data is still present on the disk, but the file name, creation date, and owner have been erased because that's in the directory. So you have the data, but you don't have information, the metadata. And then you have, and those are timestamps, there's unallocated space on the disk that is no longer in use that may have fragments of files, and there's file slack, which are chunks of file at the end of one allocation unit. So just a smaller than four kilobyte piece of data left at the end of a file that never includes the start of a file, and therefore is very hard to reconstruct, but it might have readable text in it or something. And then there's partition tables that list all the segments of the physical hard drive, and these are concepts that matter. You, you might want to image a partition, you might want to image the whole drive. So each file system has its own unique way of doing it. They all do essentially the same thing. They have to have some kind of directory to keep give files names, owners, and sizes, and then some way of laying out the clusters on a disk in a rapidly searchable tree-like fashion. 
but they differ in the details. NTFS has a bunch of timestamps and it has these alternate data streams. Uh, UFS has this thing called inodes to keep track of which nodes are disk in use. And then there's HFS is my is an Apple system that has these things called resource forks and file allocation tables back in the days of MS-DOS and Windows 98 and such. These are all just different ways of doing the same thing, but you can go deeply into this. And I've taught some forensics classes where you really went deeply into the file structure where you were patching broken NTFS um, data streams and stuff. Yeah. What do resource forks do? I've forgotten what resource forks are. I think they're essentially the same thing as inodes, but there, there are differences. And there's, if you want this, this is the famous book. I taught, I took a class in this book and I taught a class using stuff from this book. Brian Carrier wrote a tool that is more perfect than any other tool at reconstructing like fragments of files and putting them back together. And he wrote a book about this and I went into it. Then I, you know, I, I kind of moved away from it because it turned out that the products will do it for you. Most real forensic analysts don't really understand it at this level. They just run a tool, the tool reconstructs the files and they don't worry about it. But I did go pretty deeply into it at one time. It seemed exciting. You know, anyway, um, it is interesting where you actually look at the disk block by block and try to repair it. Um, and anyway, then there's application specific artifacts. Typically what you want is emails, uh, internet browser cache, internet history, that sort of thing, um, chat program history. And each program keeps this to some extent. And there are a lot of tools like Internet Evidence Finder from Magnet Forensics that will just specifically harvest all this stuff and put it in a nice structure so you can read through people's emails and chat messages because you always want that. Every time you investigate any kind of crime or incident, you need to see who's been talking to what, who's in on the conspiracy, who sent the file around, you know. It's very common. And um, people often make foolish attempts to delete this stuff and then deleting it often doesn't work. And with the bright tool, you can reconstruct it from the fragments that are left on there. So this is very high value data and there's a bunch of expensive tools just to recover it efficiently. And then the usual user data, your files, your photographs, your Word documents, your PDF files and all that jazz. Um, you may have it on your own laptop, but if you're at a company, you typically do not let people store things locally on their company machine. They store it all on the server, so it can be backed up and accessed from all the locations. And uh, anyway, but you, there will be some place where they have their personal user data, and that's always of a lot of value. Then you got all this network data, DHCP logs, DNS logs, proxy server logs, so you can find out where the traffic is actually going. You need those so you can figure out what network packets are actually going to which machine. If you do the uh, Splunk projects that I see YKang doing all the time, a lot of those are what IP address did this person have on this day? And you have to get back to that so you can find out where they went there. And you've got firewalls and IPS and NetFlow records of all the traffic on the network, and you have to be able to tie it to MAC addresses and IP addresses to figure out where it's going. So you can get raw data. Once you've got some data, you could just have a raw DD image, just the literal image of say a hard drive or something or an SSD, that's one way to go. Or you can put it in some kind of custom format and you might have hardware devices or broken devices. Um, I remember when I did this years ago in the financial field, I would get one time, they, one of my big cases, they gave me just a pack of like 20 eight inch floppies rubber banded together. That was the company's backups on a shelf. They raided the building, kicked down the door, arrested the people, grabbed their backups and gave you the backups. Here, figure out what this junk is. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's what you get. You get data. And so you have, you have to try to figure out what you have. People will often give you data. Yeah, you know, I put this stuff on a flash drive. Here it is. And you have to find out, try to find out what it is. Whatever it is, you record it in your evidence book so you can say where you got it and analyze it. But if you didn't collect it yourself, then there will be some issue of where did it come from and is it really authentic, but you record whatever it is. Um, so if you get disk images, if the disk is encrypted, you're pretty much host. This is why the FBI has such an attitude. If you really use high quality disk encryption like BitLocker and you use end-to-end -end encrypted stuff like WhatsApp, then the investigator is pretty much host. All they've got is garbled nonsense. They probably can't get the key and they pretty much can't get any good out of it. So it's a problem. Um, if you, uh, and if you have something from a raid or uh, SANS or even have other problems, anyway, if you do make a copy of something and if you aren't locked out of it by encryption, which means either it was unencrypted or you have some way to get to the key, then you store it in a common format. DD is the raw copy, just bit for bit. So an image of a 500 gig hard drive is a 500 gig file. Expert witness is the most common compressed format which is what Encase uses, and there are other ones like AFF is another version that's compressed. 
Uh, it was just zip, so it doesn't matter. And then you got virtual machine files. These are just ways to store data. They all can be unzipped and extracted to the original DD, and that's just a literal copy one way or another. So in case you can handle all the formats correctly, in case is probably the number one most famous forensic tool and it has most features. Uh, access data is probably number two, and it can do most of them. In Linux, you've got a variety of much more limited, less up-to-date free tools, of course, because they don't have the huge corporation to keep them up to date. But you can mount them in various ways. You can mount those formats with various other tools and use them. And if you're very good at Linux, of course, you can get everything done for free, but you typically have to get like three or four or five tools. And you often have to write little bash scripts to tie them together. Whereas one of these expensive platforms will give you a beautiful Windows desktop with a GUI that does everything for you automatically. And that's why, like I say, I kind of lost interest in the detailed inode analysis block by block of hard drives because realistically, nobody does that anymore. They just run one of these tools that does it all for you. Anyway, um, so you can have data encoded in many ways. So this is the password to solve crime. That's base 64, which is just taking the text, turning it into ASCII, eight bits at a time, and then reading the bits six bits at a time to get numbers from zero to 63. And those numbers go to uppercase letters, lowercase letters, all the digits, and then two symbols like plus and minus. That's what base 64 is. So if you have three letters, it turns into four characters of base 64. This was originally intended to move binary images through email because email is an ASCII only medium and you can't send binary data. So you have to encode it somehow. And this is how it's encoded. This is how MIME attachments work. The second one is UU encoding, another way to encode stuff. Um, and then you have an MD5 hash. Now an MD5 hash is technically irreversible. In principle, you can't get from a hash back to the input string, but in practice, you often can just because there are gigantic dictionaries on the internet of many input strings and hashes. Now, the thing like that you might never find, but a lot of things you can reverse by just putting them in Google or running uh, John the Ripper or other tools that will try to crack it. Anyway, so here's got another problem. This is an XXD, I think they call this dump. That's the kind of thing you'll see in Wireshark and a lot of tools where they have the address here in hexadecimal and then the hexadecimal data and then on the right, the ASCII version. So this is what you'll have. And the problem is, if you look for credit card numbers as like 16 digits, you're not gonna find them because you've got maybe six or eight digits and then a bunch of junk in the middle and then the other six or eight digits. So there are not actually 16 digits in a row here. And this is very commonly the case. You're looking for something, but the data is formatted in a way that just a simple regular expression search is not gonna find it. This is what I think I spent half of my life when I worked in the financial business, just translating data from one format to another. You get data and it's never the way you want it. And you're always writing scripts and you parse it. And it turns out the spacing isn't really the same and the commas aren't always in the same place. And you spend a lot of time dealing with the exceptions, trying to clean up data to really make sure all the data correctly makes it into the next stage of process. Then of course, you got localization. You have time zones, which have already hosed a lot of students trying to do the uh, Splunk projects. You've got dollars and euros and you've got month day year or is it day month year and you've just many many irritating problems when you're dealing with data um, as it moves from one place to another where it gets annoying to figure out what's going on time zones are the worst especially since criminals will often reset the clock to obscure the time so you have to watch for clock changes it is very common that forensic data is analyzed and you're wrong about the time and you even end up blaming the wrong person or something because it happened when a different person was on the machine. Anyway, um, so here's some examples. If you have data theft, we have a very common issue. Somebody's been sneaking data out. You can try to see if you found some evidence of them zipping files and then sending them out through some unusual protocol like FTP or something. That's one way to look for it. So you look at flow data. Did they send a lot of data out? This is how Google caught China. In 2010, around Christmas, they found a bunch of data, a large amount of data, leaving their network going to China. And they're like, why is our stuff going to some server in China that is not a Google server? That doesn't look legit. And that's one good way to get started. Um, so you'll find logs at all your network devices, proxies, firewall logs, and so on. And of course, failed login events are pretty much an obvious red flag. Obviously, somebody is trying to log in without the right credentials. Um, all right, so you can look for people logging in when they shouldn't be at work. Um, connecting for too long or too short periods of time, um, running 
zip tools, downloading new zip tools and running them, recently installed services, launching hacking tools or other weird things they really shouldn't be launching. The thing we talked about last time, once you've got something running like Landest, you can actually say, show me what programs have only been run once on this machine total, because that shouldn't be happening. They should be coming to work and running usual stuff every day. So what was used only once and then deleted, that's probably a good sign that something bad is happening out there. Anyway, so you find leads. Once you have some clues like a date, then you can look for other things that happened on that date. Uh, look for things that automatically start. One thing is to use uh, Microsoft's um, SFC to verify the system binaries or a tool like Tripwire that will know the known hash of good system binaries because people often alter system binaries like group kits do and look for other indicators of compromise and virus scans. These are clues that something bad is happening on the machine. Uh, you can take legitimate tools and put them in another folder. That's a trick. And one thing to know is that more and more people don't use malware anymore. Malware is too easy to catch. More and more people live off the land. They're just putting on legitimate system tools, tools from system internals. The Microsoft system administration tools are powerful enough to do anything you want. As a matter of fact, you can do pretty much anything just in PowerShell. Now that Microsoft has a really powerful command line, you can do anything if you're just smart enough to use PowerShell. So you don't need malware unless you're a wimp. You could just use normal Microsoft utilities to do pretty much anything if you're smart enough, and then you really won't get caught by any virus scans and such. So um, you can have plans like this. If you're going to have something where you're looking for abnormal use in times, then you should have some kind of way to automate this. Like um, I know, I've talked to Kerry about this, trying to do compliance auditing. Use it, you, you need to have some process whereby it gets done regularly, and you have a whole you really collect all the data and you really send it to some good place where you can find it and index it and make a report of it. You know, automating these things is really important. This is why uh, people start out by just doing ad hoc investigations of incidents. And when they grow up and get over that, they just install proper network monitoring and auditing tools all along. So they're keeping records of everything all along. So they're ready. It's not a huge effort to get the evidence you need. And you have to plan for this. Like I said, I know I'm, these management courses are getting through to me because they wanted to give us money to buy hardware. And they said, well, we could buy a server. And the first thing I thought is, well, are we going to actually have money to pay someone to maintain the server? I never used to think that way. And I finally like, realized, you know, you haven't done the job until you've actually planned to staff it properly. <laughs> anyway, so uh, you've got various techniques. Manual inspection is an option, sorting and filtering, statistical analysis, and file and record carving we talked about, that's where you piece together unstructured data in the un, in deleted data and put the files back together. And that is something you normally let automatic tools do for you these days, like a case. So there's a lot of external resources. There are a bunch of libraries of known files and their MD5 or SHA hashes. I used to give people a project where they would download this thing called the National Software Reference Library and then check some files to make sure they match. It turned out to not be too exciting. There are various ones of these lists out there. This one is pretty good. Bit9 is a company that did this. They just kept hashes of all the known good files, and then they got hashed so people hacked, so people could corrupt that data. So that's not good. And of course, that's the problem. Well, that must have been, uh, that must have been they, they were doing something right then. Well, that's that's one way to look at it. Yes, you. But I don't. I don't know if I. Did they have backups? That's what would be the next question. That would be a good question. Did they have backup, or do they have a way to know if their backup got hacked? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I don't know what came of this one, but um, yes, people do get hacked a lot nowadays. Virus Total is, of course, your best friend. By the way, uh, people are complaining. My website is blocked. I went to Virus Total and. And a couple of the smaller people are blocking it. They seem to figure it out themselves it's a false positive. There's some guy in Romania that keeps flagging my website as malicious. And every six months or so, some antivirus engine believes them. And for the next month, people had my stuff blocked at corporations until they figure out it's wrong. Anyway, um, Virus Total can do URLs, files, um, and uh, it's a very good way to test a suspicious file. It'll tell you if it's known to be bad or not. Um, you can inspect things by just manually looking through them, but it's a lot better to have um, automated processes for large things. Um, one important thing is that all the tools have defects. Uh, there were some famous cases. Uh, there were situations we found where end case would trigger a time and that time was wrong. You know, it's 
you can't trust any of these tools completely. One general rule is you should back up everything with another tool. Like you use a big fancy tool to find something, and then you use something like just a raw hex editor to look at the disk to make sure it's right. You should never trust anything that really matters without verifying with the second tool. Um, and that's the game here. All right. And once you have, if you have a large amount of data, you have to somehow minimize it, make it smaller to deal with. So there are tools to try to make it easier to summarize it, get a statistical list, or get some kind of graph so you can spot the outliers. Um, so you can filter by things to try to find it. Uh, you can do some kind of statistical analysis to try to figure out what mass of this data is normal and what the outliers are in various ways. And Sawmill is one of the many data visualization tools that are out there. So you can graph it in various ways and notice how many page views there are in like 10 minute seconds. You can tell something was happening at this time. A whole bunch of people accessing all at once and otherwise. This is just general tricks to like cut it this way and cut it that way. I used to do this a lot when I was in the financial industry because we had lists of people and we had to get the duplicates out of the list. And we would have like five copies of the same name and address spelled wrong. Maybe they moved, maybe they got married and the name changed. And we had all these ways to try to get things that matched, like, like parts of the name match and parts of the address match. There were just ways to sweep through the data to get the outliers and anomalies. And none of them are perfect, but there are ways to cut it this way and cut it that way and get the outliers. Another thing we often did was large claim analysis, just to get the high value ones and audit them specifically, make sure there's not a mistake there. Uh, you have to realize you'll never be perfect, but you do make some effort to find the big mistakes and you end up a lot cleaner than if you just take data that is full of duplicates and errors and leave it that way. And the same things here, cut it in various ways to just find out what the exceptions are. Uh, and this is the general searching methodology that I learned from my favorite forensic teacher. Um, he said, this is how you actually do a real forensic case. If you don't know what you're doing, you could just spin your wheels forever. So what you do, you have the original story that comes from somebody. They tell you what's going on, like a name of a person, the name of a company, the name of a product that was stolen, the date it happened on. You get a paragraph or two of facts. You pick keywords from that. You search for those keywords in the emails and the files and everything. Then you read all that stuff and you find more keywords. You find emails sent to someone, find another name. You search again and you find more keywords and you keep going until you're not finding anything new and then you're done. You call that enough. Um, this is a concept common in physics. When you can't really do a perfect job, you just have an approximation and a way to improve the approximation. And when it stops changing, you quit. And you don't know you're right. You just know that there's no point continuing to work in this fashion. I'm not getting anywhere else. And that's what's good enough. You have to have some way to boil it down to some reasonable amount of time to do an investigation. And so that's, that's what he recommended, and that's what he really did on the job, that procedure. Uh, we talked about this before. Unallocated space on your disk is blocks that are not currently used by any active file. So they either are zeroed or they contain junk left over from a previous file. And that may be useful, but if you do reconstruct files there, you will not have a name, an owner, or a date of creation. So it is of limited value, but there is some value there. And the, all the uh, forensic suites will automatically reconstruct files and put them in a special folder. And you can look at the images and read the emails and stuff. But uh, you have to be aware that you don't have the usual metadata that would help you determine how important it is. And file carving is just putting together data that it finds lost somewhere and trying to reconstruct images and files and such. You look for a header and a footer and just try to take the blocks in between. Foremost is a nice tool you'll find in Kali Linux that does this automatically. And there are many other tools that do it um, that just reconstruct files in simple ways. Typically what they do is just look for a file header and look for a file footer. And if they find these two together, just assume everything in the middle is not fragmented and call that an image. And so we look at the images. Some of them are good and some of them have weird junk in the middle and are broken in half and stuff. Um, so when you're done, you have to evaluate results. You should do this periodically. As you're going, decide if you're actually getting somewhere. Often you're going the wrong direction. You're wasting your time. You know, uh, So during, during, during the investigation, you should stop and assess, am I getting somewhere? I've Certainly learned this a lot. I often start writing projects and it just turns into a nest and I just quit, come back another day and try another way to get through. Um, and at the end, you're gonna decide, have you managed to achieve your goal and answer the question or not? So uh, here's one I did. I did the Department of Defense bug bounty program the first time, maybe three years ago. And it was all .NET nuke. And at that time, I didn't know anything about .NET. And I had no clue what to do. So I ran a vault scanner. It told me 300 remote code executions. And I said, Oh, uh, it can't be that easy. Those were, of course, all false positives. 
but you know, as far as I got, other people made money. I didn't find anything good. I might do a little better now. I know a little more about .NET, but I don't know. Anyway, I got some cahoots about this stuff, and then uh, well, that'll be enough for today. Except I'll stick around to help people on projects. So we're here at chapter eleven. Let's see if we got any chat messages. Oh, chat messages are coming in. Uh oh, I didn't see them. Use it for one of our clients. I don't like it. Uh, perhaps you're talking about land desk. Yeah, use it for patch management, machine inventory. Yeah, webcam. Yeah, I don't know about that. All right. Anyway, um, yeah. All right. I see some chat messages, but I don't know if I have much to add to them. Anyway, um, Giuliani was in Seinfeld. <laughs> well, all right. <clears throat> Was he on Seinfeld? Yeah. Okay, well. Well, that might be good, actually. I know appearing on Saturday Night Live is a pretty good move for presidential candidates and stuff. Of course they do, for the whole week up to Halloween. Yes. And pumpkins, too. There was a, a good video I saw online of like Alaska. They have their jack-o'-lanterns out there and a moose comes along and eats them. <laughs> Which is what would happen in my hometown. Not with the moose, it would be raccoons there. My goodness, we got DJ Hard Beer, or perhaps an imposter. This is like there's somebody keeps being not Kirk or something. That's one of the many security defects of this product. People can impersonate people. I will send you the binary called PayCal. We're on the binary, Sam. <laughs> okay. Sure. Go ahead and send me something. Uh, I'll be around on Saturday. You can talk to me about it. Yes, well, you got some malware. Neat. Let's see what. I, yeah. All right. yeah, well, there's plenty of interesting mail. Okay, here's another chat message. Saturday, good, okay, good, all right. So I'll wait a few more seconds to see if we got any more. All right, apparently this is it. Okay. So what device doesn't store any user data? All right, of course, the firewall typically doesn't. Let's see if this chat, what's happening Saturday. Oh, just he wants to meet me on Saturday. Saturday, I think there'll just be usual class here and preparing for CTF teams. But watch him want to talk to me about something then. Something sort of like a CTF. Anyway, firewall is the answer to this one. So uh, which disk format is expert witness? EO1, people often think that stands for encase, but it's actually expert witness, a long dead product, but they made the standard, which encase then adopted. Anyway, um, what's the format used for virtual machines? <clears throat> VMDK? I don't know what it stands for, but that's the VMware virtual disk format. All right. What encoding uses uppercase, lowercase, and numbers? Okay, base 64. All right, that's how you can spot it. All right, and what technique reconstructs images by finding headers and footers? That's file carving. All right. So I got three DJ Hard B. I bet that's Caitlin. She looks pretty <laughs> guilty. Yep, I thought so. I I can kind of tell by now. Um, all right. And then I got M Hino, which is a real name. And K is probably Carla. 
Good, okay. I'm learning the, uh, the system. All right. So you've got some projects to do. Make a domain and put on that land desk stuff and see how you love it. It's pretty tedious, but you really need to get used to that stuff. And uh, I'll stick around and help anybody. If you want to work here, I'm going to stop the share. And I'll see you folks next week. Farewell. For the online.